Why, good morning. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, thank you for an opportunity to share the work that we get a chance to do and talk about a field that is civil rights. How do we go from here? Where do we go? Grant Montgomery, cradle of civil rights, the birthplace. We have a strong history here of building and making things better. I'm reminded that in 1954, when Dr. King came to Montgomery, he was only 27 years old. And oftentimes, we don't even think about that. We don't think about the attorney, Fred Gray, who's only 28 years old when Rosa Parks was locked up and he was the attorney there who was serving her against a system that was much greater than either of them. I say that this morning because oftentimes we discount our work and what we're bringing to the table. Dr. King did not wake up in 1955 to be on the Washington Monument today. He woke up in 1955 answering the call of the day. He woke up in 1955 in December with a need in front of him that he found that needed to be addressed and did not look for a way to walk around it, did not look for a path away from it, did not look for excuses, ways that he could put it on someone else's shoulder. But Dr. King went towards the need, and we are better, the world is better, society is better. We're in this room today because of that work that was done back then. With that, I challenge us today to address what we see, address the obstacles, things that are in front of us that we know today that is hard, that are hard, difficult. Some of the challenges today that the world, 50 years and 60 years, would have needed us to address. And if we bypass, if we push the assignment somewhere else, then the future will pay the cost. I get a chance to go back into a place that I feel I will burst for. Dr. Schiller reminded you that I'm the ninth child of 13 children. Even after me, they wanted more children. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I am the seventh son of eight males. My parents got married in 1945. Had children for 20 plus years. My father was part of what we call that greatest generation. Born and raised in West Alabama, went off to war to serve the country, came back home and married a girl that he was in love with. And they went back to that family in Marigo County and started having children and later moved to Mobile. My father got a job there in Mobile working at Alcohol Aluminum Company. And the history tells us that my father worked there for 33 years and they had no days that he was late for work. They had no record of him missing work. He worked every day. He sometimes worked swing shift and double shifts. He was that kind of a person that duty called and he answered. 
on March the 7th, 6th, if you will, 1972. My dad's 49 years of age. My mother was 46 years of age. The two of them went to a revival at church. Drove from Montgomery, maybe to Montgomery. Mobile, it was Hattiesburg, Mississippi. In that service that night, my mother had a heart attack in church and did not come home alive. I was 13 years old on that March the 6th day, March the 7th, when I woke up that morning with my house full of, full of people from everywhere. Not even remembering even today who tapped me on the shoulder and told me mom was never coming back there to live again. And I say that to say that because I remember going to school on March the 6th, the last day, that Monday. My homework was checked. My lunch was packed. My clothes was ironed. And after March the 6th or March the 7th, my mom went to be with the Lord. My whole world was turned upside down. I remember trying to move forward and comprehend all the new things that would happen in my life. I had four siblings, I have four siblings that are younger than I am. Those four siblings went to live with my father's parents. So Ken Austin, 13, was too old to go. My siblings who were older than I, I was too young for them. So March the 6th, I was in a family of 13. After March the 6th, I was an only child. I had to build a whole different world. My father, still the person who worked hard, and worked at the aluminum company, worked swing shift. Ken Austin was 13 years old, living with his father, who would go to work from 7 to 3 p.m. one week. The next week he would go from 3 to 11, and the following week from 11 to 7. I had a lot of field days. <laughs> On first shift, that was my week to work. I came home from school and I was the best kid in the world. Being there at home and have my bed made up and all the things that need to happen was done. I was only one week out of the month. The next week when dad was working third shift, Going to work at 3 o'clock, I think we got home about the same time they left. I was 13 years old and responsible for my own deed. Not mature enough to manage it, but just doing what society would do with a 13-year-old. I did all the things that was, should not have been done, and I got a chance to do that until finished in high school, I lived that kind of a life. Being three people, being a 3D level kid, being a kid when dad go to work at 11 o'clock, when he would go to work at 11 o'clock. Back in those days, the TV would go off, but we would come on. The TV went off at midnight, but all of us, it was bad kids. And, to find something else to do. I say that to say that we need civil rights. We need society to step up and to embrace communities. What happened for Ken Austin that caused me still to be able to stand here today and to not get caught up in drugs, crime, and all those things, it wasn't because the family that I was living in, it was because of a community that embraced me. That community was a ministry, I can look back today and call on ministry of our people. Miss Sally on the corner, 
would not allow Ken Austin to do things that he wanted to do. He screamed behind my house at a voice and authority to say and to do something about anything that she thought that was wrong being done. I grew up understanding the value of bringing a community together. I moved away from home when I was 19. I went to South Carolina for the weekend. I stayed there for five years. I went to stay for the weekend and I met a girl the day I was, the first day I was there. And that weekend ended up being five years. My wife was a high school student that year. My father called me to his bedside and said, what are your intentions around here? And certainly he was a big guy and I had no intentions, sir. <laughs> I just wanted to help cut your grass and whatever you need me to do. And he said that I would ask you to do one thing for me. He said, do not marry my daughter until she finished college. That was five years later. Five years later, graduation night, and just <laughs> after graduation, we got married. I stayed in South Carolina, went to school there for tool and die. I worked as a machinist. And back in those days, in the 80s, I'm saying these things for a purpose, but back in those days, in the 80s, steel mills was closing down. So after 83, after my wife finished college, uh, I got laid off in the steel mill. And certainly did not want to get in a long line. We was young and we thought we'd join the Air Force and see the world. And that's what we did. We joined the Air Force. I took a oath to join the Air Force and kind of go see the world and go back, come back to South Carolina and live. That's what we thought. Joined the Air Force and from basic training, they gave me some papers like this and saying, uh, your assignment is Montgomery, Alabama. And I said, no. <laughs> I left Alabama already. And I um, joined the Air Force to see the world. Did you not see my dream sheet? And they asked me, did I know anything about lawful orders? And I did not know anything about lawful orders. Needless to say, on October 3rd, 1983, I was assigned to Maxwell Air Force Base. And we came to Maxwell and we stayed there for 10 years I served in Air Force. And all 10 years we served. My wife went back to school here uh, in Alabama at Alabama State and got her master's and was hired on as a student there, became a professor at Alabama State. So once I got out of the Air Force, that was the only reason we stayed. We never planned this trip at all. But what I had to do in the Air Force, because uh, the Air Force required you to have community service, is that I served in the juvenile court system on Air Base Blue. And when I walked into the juvenile court system, I saw those 13-year-old Ken Austins, kids who did not have a community around them, did not have the guidance that I had. It was just as inquisitive, if you would, I was, I won't use bad, but they would, they had all the tendencies that I found myself had, just did not have the guidance, did not have anyone around them to check them. And those children was in the court system because they didn't have a community around them. And I saw trading places. I started saying, what happened if at that time President Reagan was in office? I said, what happened if President Reagan's children did not have a structure around them? What happened if the Bush family didn't have all of those structures around them? Where would they be today? And I started thinking, that how can we judge these children about where they are today by what you see today? And I started working at that point trying to help children who was disadvantaged to have an advantage. And I found the greatest way to do that was with my time. Someone said to me that if you're judging a fish 
by how well it climbs the tree is a failure from the beginning. If you go in poverty and look at those children and start judging them based upon the condition and what they're doing and their thinking and their behavior, if you judge them based upon those criteria, they're already failures. But if you were to roll your sleeves up and to walk back in those communities, partner with them, as Dr. Sheila does, come over and support the education system, cause the work that these children need to be realized and available and tangible and at their disposal. You see, as I see today in this room, you know, people here who can make the difference. Oftentimes, we want to be judged from our givings by Bill Gates. If we can't write the check and we can't give as Bill Gates gives, then we feel we're not doing anything. But I beg the difference. There is something that Bill Gates has that you have. And it's sometimes what you have may even be more valuable, and that's time. The ministry of the presence in the lives of people who are in need is so much more valuable than tangible things. All the money we get, we spend. We try to do it well. We try to use it for good causes. But the time that you come and bring and spend in that community, walking along beside people in need, we can never, ever value how far it goes. We have no way to measure uh, the impact upon your presence in the community. We have no way to measure the, the impact mentoring a young child in that community gives, how far it goes. We have no way to measure sitting down at the table uh, with a child, helping them with math and science and learning to read. We can't tell you how far that will go. And you're probably throwing tomatoes at me now saying, Pastor Austin, talk about civil rights. These are rights that's going to bring a society civil. These are things that if you bring these children up, they'll be able to stand up for their own rights. But as long as these children uh, don't have the ability uh, to read, to work, and to provide for themselves. They're always going to have to be someone speaking on their behalf. But if you educate them, if you empower them, you cause them to be able to stand on their own, you won't have to worry about uh, marching for them. They'll march for themselves. You don't have to worry about speaking on their behalf. They'll be able to speak for themselves. They'll be able to do, as we have found in history, open heart surgery and so many other things that we have found been invented by people who look just like them. But if you give them your presence, your time, uh, give them part of you, you'll be surprised what's inside sometime of that dark cloud over that person's head. If I had been left to March the 6th, March the 7th, 1972 alone, I could not have survived. The weight of that day was greater than I had strength. My family loved me. My father was the best man I ever knew in the world, the strongest man, but he could not do it alone. It took a community, it took people, it took us embracing a society I'm saying that to say to us here in this room, we got to be bigger than this room. We got to embrace the city. We got to embrace the lease. We got to embrace the whole. If any part of it is going to be better, it's going to take up every part to be better. How do you build a chain that's going to build, going to pull out? You work really hard on the weakest link. When I work into tool and die, and I work in metal and machinery and iron and steel. The weakest part was where we tempered the steel to make sure that we could make it harder. So that part would be able to withhold the strength to pull something out. 
We wasn't so concerned about those who was already out. We certainly tried to make sure that that was uh, 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 capable of doing what was needed. But we knew uh, uh, the, the ability to pull. We had to temper that steel hard. We had to make sure that that iron that was going to pull a load would need to be stronger and doable. If we purpose now to start focusing on those that are weak, those who are without, start strengthening those people, the people in our community and those in our society who may be left out, may not have all the opportunities that we are afforded. If we go back and start working on each one of those people, we will better this society. We will better the world. We will better us as a people. I'm concerned, you know, even today as I look to see it on the news this morning, the war around the world. How I was in Israel uh, back in March and February, and, and, and I could see people who, who had generations of knowledge was passed down to children. I was at the Wailing Wall, and I could see families with children, little children, looking like grandfathers. All of them had generations of wealth and knowledge that was passed down one to the other. And when I go back into poverty, and I see children, a babe who just leave in a hospital, who has no connection with a father. And I see young girls who teenagers and, and young trying to find an identity and don't have a, a father to embrace them. And then we expect them so much from those little girls and we expect them so much from those children. And, and those of us who, who can do and, and ought to do are not doing and we're sitting back expecting more from situations where it can't come from. We're wondering why they say Gibbs Village is the single parent capital of Alabama. Why? Because we refuse to go into those places and to speak into those situations. We refuse to go into Gibbs Village and they call it the high school dropout capital of Alabama. More high school drops out from that single government housing community than any other zip code in the whole state of Alabama. And it's right here, walking proximity to us. Why we let those things be our flight? Why won't we, like Dr. King, wrote about slaves and march against those things? Why won't we say, not on our watch? This is not going to be what's written in history uh, left for Ken Austin. We have to make a dis decision on our own that we go back and tackle hard things, difficult things. And the hardest thing I think that we have in 2023 that we have to face is uh, the ability to not see what is there. We are really, really uh, mastered uh, looking across the aisle, or looking up around the room, or seeing the young problems and situations. But we figure out how to look problems in the eye, purpose in our heart, that we're going to roll our sleeves up and do work that we can do to help make those things come to pass. I didn't get a chance to invent anything new in Montgomery. The New Walk Life Church was a need that we found in that community and we just answered that need. We opened up doors for people we thought needed a place that they could find a source greater than themselves. And we opened up an abandoned building and caused that to happen. We didn't create a mercy house. We found people who needed food we bought an abandoned house and we put inside that house food that people could come and get food. Just answering what the needs were. We did not create the pathway house. 
He was looking at people who did not have the ability to do applications and did not know how to work keyboards and work on a use a computer properly. So we took another abandoned place and opened up a house in the pathway and said, this is the pathway house. You can come to this place and learn how to use a computer. You can have a business in a key code, if you would, inside, where you can uh, apply online for application, take care of businesses. Those are the things that we answered. We did not create what is the Mercy House. We literally was answering of the needs of families there who did not have clean clothes. So we created a clothes closet. And we realized that those clothes needed to be washed, so we added washers and dryers inside of a house so people in the community who did not have could come and wash and dry their clothes. We realized that those same people who was washing and drying their clothes also needed to take showers. So we gutted that house again and the closets that was there. We made white or showers in there, male and female showers that people could come in and take showers. Not trying to make history, not desiring ever that anyone would know our name, but always that it was answering the needs that was in front of us. We realized during the pandemic that the children in that community was already behind academically. So we opened our doors even during the pandemic of making our space available where children could come in still and we can put hands on them. We know inside of our homes, most of the homes didn't have anyone there who was able to help them before the pandemic, the homework. We were doing them before, we was helping them before the pandemic. But after the pandemic, we know that there was likely no one in the home who was able to help them with their schoolwork. So we opened up opportunities, we opened up an enrichment program, we used our own Wi-Fi, we did all those things that children in that community could come and still try to stay on task with virtual learning. After virtual learning, after school went back, we realized in that community, most of those kids were so far behind. And we still, every day, still every day, do all that we can. Dr. Shiller has helped us invent programs and uh, opportunities to reach those children there academically, still trying to pull them up, still trying to uh, bring them to a place where uh, they too can compete on stages like this. Dr. Shiller came back in the community and sit down with us and say, Ken, she said, I worked with this, I operated this before. We operate a parent program, a parenting program. So we went back to create there in that community a program where we can't get parents into PTE at school, but we created that community a parenting program there where parents will partner with us inside of a heart community to help us to change the scope of that whole community. These are things that we can still do. These are civil rights that we can answer today. These are things that we can do right now. I plead with you, I beg you, to come and go with us. Come march with us. We are marching every day. We got flags, we got signs, and we are making a lot of noise. On Sunday, we got a chance to hear a report for our children. And our report Sunday was 90% of our children in our program, we have a capability of 200 children that we touch every day. But we had to report Sunday that 90% of those children was on an AB on road. We had a report Sunday that only, I think, seven out of all the children that we served had a D. Which before, it was the opposite. The 90 had the D, and the 70% was, was uh, uh, we had, I should say, 90% was failing, and we only had 70% that had an A, an A, B, O, and O. We are flipping things, we're changing things, we're changing the culture. We're opening up safe spaces there that we need your help. Uh, we have a gym and an adult uh, 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 inside entertainment center that we need 
strength and, and, and the laborers to come and help us to keep it open in the evening for children who want to be in a safe place, who don't want to be a part of the crime, who don't want to be a part of all those things that's going bad. We have a safe place for them to go, but we don't have bodies. We don't have chaperones. We don't have people there to help us demand it. You can give back. You don't have to be the Bill Gates. You can give some time. You can come and walk along with us to help us to make these kind of things happen. And one of the things, we just had a telethon last week, and, and, and the accountant and all those people say we raised almost $400,000. And I, I, had, I had the same amount of money as I had when we had the telethon. I had none then, I still have none. But I gave a lot to make that happen. And I'm saying to you that you can do the same thing too. You, I was on TV, I was telling people about the needs of that community. You can give what I gave. I didn't have a dollar, I didn't have hundreds of thousands of dollars, I didn't have any of the funding that I could put on the play to make the needle go up. But I gave my time. I shared the information of what we was doing. You can do that with us today. You can go to our website, you can go to what we're doing and share, make people know our story, tell them what we're doing, uh, get involved in that way. That can help us in ways that you can never, ever uh, imagine. Taking us into your circle, into your community, uh, telling people about good work that's going on even here in Montgomery. That will help us to continue this work. So that's worth more than dollars and cents because I did not have any of the dollars. I did, could not write any of those checks. We had friends that wrote big checks and some wrote small. I didn't have either one of those checks. But we caused it working together to make it happen. So I invite you to be a part of that. We got Giving Tuesday coming up in a little few weeks. All those things you can help us just share, share, share the information about the work we're doing. And those who have money was able to bring that $400,000 in one day into a pot causing us to continue to work. If you do what Ken Austin does, do, get a chance to do every day, just tell the story, tell about something good, then you can also be a partner with us. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here, and I'm so thankful. Thank you, Dr. Cobb, for inviting me, and I hope I said something that encouraged some of you. minutes around the tables to process a little bit and to reflect together with those at your table so I hope that some of you took notes I hope and I know that I know that class starts in a few minutes so some of you are going to have to leave but I hope that if, so if you're at a table where there are only a few people you can join another table I'm going to give you about five minutes to just to reflect and talk together and I'm going to give uh, Pastor Austin a chance to catch his breath, and then we'll open the floor for, for Q&A. So let's take a few minutes to talk around our tables.
party.
work on what's in front of you, and it made me think about how we've separated ourselves in Montgomery. I can go to work, go to the grocery store, and go home and not see some of the problems that I need to be more aware of. What can we do in our community to help you know, bring the bigger, all of us together? Prioritize that. Prioritize the fact that this is one Montgomery. Make that a, a, a part of your priority to make sure that we're doing all the work we can to bridge Montgomery together. We're only going to be as strong as the weakest part of Montgomery. Montgomery is never going to fly above the lowest level. So we realize that we don't strengthen a whole. Montgomery is always going to be affected by all of it. So yes, so work hard to bridge it. We can move away, but it doesn't go away. It's still here, so we have to make sure we know that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katora. Um, obviously, you, but I was at I was wondering, do you? Um, I know you say you have like a mentoring program, and I just wanted to ask, do you feel like are your mentors like adults or don't they like college students? Because I've um, I'm a mentor myself, so like I've come to realize and know that. The closer, not really closer in age, but like the closer in age the mentor and child are, the better it is, the better the child is off in a sense. Because they like they can relate and be able to talk to the mentor more. Because when you have a mentor that's an adult, do you feel like you need more college kids there to be able to build that gauge and build that gap? I don't know how to spell yes. <laughs> <laughs> we had this summer, we had six college students who stayed with us throughout the whole summer for nine weeks. Uh, probably 10 hours a day throughout the week, six, six days a week with those kids. So yes, we welcome, we need, we desire to have close proximity to them, reach them every day. So yes, yes, and please yes, come and sign up with us. It's important for you to have college mentors, but you definitely need a mentors that have gone on beyond that. Like we're just sitting here talking this morning. I can only take you where I've been. Uh, I've been on the phone. I had two conversations with us. They're not students, they're professionals. This morning before I left my house before eight. Because there's nuggets of wisdom in every phase of your life that you go. And it has to be some decisions within yourself. What are you willing to give? So, yeah, see, I'm some old folks too. <laughs> so Dr. Sheila mentored the educators there. So they meet with her, sometimes even at home. She had in her home. We've been in her house and meetings. Those were the teachers. Those were who were the teachers who were trying, who were teaching their children there. I have a friend of mine who's 91 years old who's actually sit down as a pastor, sit down and talk with me. So each one of us try to have someone who can impart. But certainly where we are, we welcome those children we want to believe that they too can be in college. They too can struggle and do the work necessary to go to the next level. So we welcome you to come and be that liaison towards there, please. I have some more answers. Who has more questions? I would like to ask, so one of the things that you mentioned in, in your talk several times, this was sort of a running theme, was you answered the needs that were right in front of you, but one of the things you mentioned was uh, sometimes you have, you, you have to train yourself to see the needs in front of you. We can look at needs all we want, but if we aren't actually seeing them, if we aren't actually appreciating them as needs, then we won't answer those calls in front of us. So I wonder if you could talk just a little bit more about what it means to have eyes to see the needs in front of us. Because I think so many of us uh, want to run away when we see um, issues that, that, that we just don't know what to do. So what does it mean to, to really see a need and to really appreciate that need as a need um, so that we can answer it? I'll say this, and I did say this earlier, but after my mom passed away and I went back to school with a whole different life, one that I did not want, living the life I didn't want, so my, I, I lived differently, uh, I, and the only coping mechanism I had back then was acting out. So I, I became a class clown because I didn't have my homework. My dog ate all of the homework, and we didn't have a dog. All those things, I'm just telling you, all that, all that we created. And teachers there, 
and people there who saw something different and they knew that something else was going on other than what was being presented. And so sometimes you see what's being presented and you don't understand the underlying source of it and that's what takes time and presence there. So it takes being there to understand that Ken Austin is capable of doing his work, something else is going on here. And that's what I uh, would have you to realize. That sometimes we're looking at something, but until we put the time, spend the time to know what the situation might be, we may never be able to answer. Got space for maybe one or two more questions. Thank you so much for being here. I, um, I was wondering if you could speak to some of the concerns of, you know, we live in a world where if you, if you step out to help, it can look condescending. And also how it can end up on the internet. And you can be called names for trying to, if it's misinterpreted, you know. Um, for example, if I see a child wandering the street, the first thing that I think of is I'm gonna get shot if I try to touch that child. Um, and that's very negative, and I wish I didn't think like that. Um, but I assume that if I were a parent, I'd, if I saw a stranger touching my child, it might cross my mind too. Um, <laughs> so I can hardly blame that instinct of protection. It seems like everyone is very siloed, and we're scared that you know either we're going to get shot or we're you know going to end up on the internet or for trying to do the right thing but being mis. Yeah, I share those same concerns and fears. And that's the reason why we built what we have an incubator. We built a system that you can work with then to cause those things to happen. I can't go outside and touch any child. I have to work within a system too to be able to help the child. So I can't stop along the school and see something wrong on the streets and, and, and speak in a situation I have not been a part of. I have to kind of figure out how to get inside of that system to speak into it. So what we have done at MAP and at the Mercer House, we've created an incubator that you come there, walk along beside us, you're in a safe place, safe to serve, and a place that people will receive service. Some, you know, all of us have those been download some stuff in our brain that we can't get all past. But you'll find these children have not been downloaded with that ugliness and sometimes that bias. They're looking for love and they can identify it wholeheartedly. They'll call you out. They know love. They know when you care. They know when you're concerned. So uh, you may find some old people like me who still bias and still, you know, not gonna cross the line. I'm not gonna say it, but I don't know what the ties. I mean, I'm like Alabama fan. Did you guys know that? <laughs> and I probably won't get persuaded in this room. That's what I'm saying. And so same thing there. Those children, they haven't even decided yet. And they welcome your love. You'll be surprised how much you can help them. So, Dr. Shea. I just have to say this. Children appreciate love and respect. I don't care what comes to They know they know when you're bending down on your knees saying, Amy, are you okay? I went in one morning. There's a little girl sitting in the corner. And I could tell she was kept looking at her fingers, so I immediately just walked over to her. She had scraped her finger outside. Immediately I said, go get me some center. Not alcohol. Don't bring me alcohol. Alcohol does what? Burn. Burn. I said, just give me some fresh water. Bring me a bag. You think she cared what color I was? I met her again. 
get it that time. So don't, the thing is, you've got to get it rid of that within our own minds as adults. Because that's really not what it is. They appreciate, even the parents appreciate, the love and concern is not a common there. So we have to just say, okay, you want to here and I'm do what I need to do. I can't cheat. They're going to respond by this positive way to I just want to add on to what Dr. Austin said. I had the opportunity to ride along on the bus and be out at the Youth Navigation Center last week and the hugs. I mean, I would say I was doing it for the kids, but it was really for me because I love hugs and they just come up. They love you so much. It's like a new face and um, it really is amazing. We need to have a war hawk serve day where they can just come out. Anybody who wants to come, y'all can all come together and it could be war hawk day at Matt. Wouldn't that be awesome? One more question, maybe there's some space for one more question. Wonderful, yes. Hi. Um, so my name is Melissa, and I just have a question about the whole mentoring thing. How would exactly would I go about coming to be a mentor, a part of the program? Give me a uh, Like here is one of our students, the mentors here, she's a student here, and one at the program. So you can bring contact information, we can sign up and get all the information you need to get you ready to get part of it. So we welcome you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Roy wants to ask the last question. First and last, right? <laughs> um, my last question is uh, how do you think social media? has affected the sense of community. Social, social media is tells stories before it actually happens. Sometimes it puts out false information before the reality is, is sad. But we try to get in front of social media with good. We try always to get good stories, good information out, and we try hard to do that. We can't control all the stuff out there, and I know you can spend the energy on it, but it's a lot of negativity that goes out there. If you keep your ear to it, you stay plugged into it, you can never come down the earth. So I don't stay there, but if you watch the work that we're doing, we always talk about something good, we're always trying to uh, tell a good story about something that somebody can do good, and that's what we say. So we use it against whatever sometimes the purpose seems to be for social media. We get a lot of negative stuff. We see that all the time. That you never find that associated with us. We always talk about good. And people still, even with us, even with the good we do, you know, the media take it to a different place. But we always try to drive it back to a place that's good. We are an incubator. If you're familiar with that. We're a safe place that you come and be a part of. You'll get help, and the people you get help will be helped also. So we, we built that. We're constantly honing that to make it safe. If you come there, you're safe. If you say you're in Mercy House and Matt, the guards go with them. They know you're there for the right reason, and that's the people that we invite to work with. Thank you. I think that's a good place to, to wrap up today. Please join me in thanking Pastor Ken Austin. See you at the first house in Mount Wilson. I've seen you around. Yeah, I know. Oh, you? I didn't know you were. Uh, wait, that was. Uh, yeah, I was like, okay, so there we there go. go. We yes, were sir. both trying to be like, okay, we can't be.